All right. All right, so welcome guys, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending. It's great to see so many of you here. Once again, congratulations on uh, your successful application for your mini woodland in your Harris Corner. This is a very exciting new EIP pilot project for Barn Bio Trust. You are very welcome to this information session uh, with Bernard Carey. He is a tree nurser who has grown the beautiful native barn pine trees for you that you will receive Saturday next week. Bernard, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Thank you. Bernard thank you. is providing us with about 2,000 saplings, barn pine saplings, that we've, dist we've distributed these pro rata uh, over all Harris Corner May Woodland applicants. So as to leave nobody behind, so everyone is getting trees, it means that all the woodland applicants are getting to plant trees on their land, which is fantastic. Uh, so depending on the area you've available as uh, for planting, as you've indicated in your questionnaire, you'll get a certain number of trees uh, and that was topped, up, uh, topped off as, at 277 trees in total. A fourth, well, more or less a fourth uh, of this total number will be barn pines and then the rest, so three quarters of that's the rest will be companion species. And that's going to be a combination of birch, elder, oak, hawthorn, hazel, and holly. And this evening, Bernard is going to provide you with background information on, on the barn pine trees and as well, um, how to plant those and how to take care of those. Um, and if you have a question for Bernard, you can just type your question in the Q and A box down below at your bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer all these questions at the at the end of the, the session. Um, one final, final reminder, I guess, before we start, uh, your pickup day is Saturday next week, the 12th of February, in the community hall in Tauber. Uh, Prangeli, who's also here today, my colleague from Barn Bio Trust, she will be there, uh, and Brendan will be there, and you're, most of you guys are familiar with us three, and we're very much looking forward to seeing you there. Um, if anything changes, just give us a ring and we'll sort you. Last but not least, I'll also be recording this session, so um, I'll send you an email with the link when it's up on our YouTube channel. So I guess without any further ado, Bernard, the floor is yours. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, apologies ahead, there's typos in this, and um, I'm not so used to uh, giving a presentation in general, but particularly when I can't get any feedback for the crowd, so... I might be rushing, so I'm relying on Karen and Prentil to intervene maybe every now and then to ask questions on your behalf, and then we we'll take questions at the end. So I'll start anyway. Um, so just why why the barren pine? Uh, because I, I don't know who my crowd is, who the people that are listening are exactly. Basically. There was some research papers a few years ago that determined that the pine up in Rock Forest uh, dated back to the original Scots pine that would have been in Ireland pre uh, about 1500 BC or so. Um, and here's some of the examples of the papers that were there, Jenny Roach. I, I first came across it um, on Michael Bynings, the Irish Times, and then I looked up to these papers that you can see, you can look up yourself on the internet for further information. So the pine is, it, we have barn pine, as I, I refer to them, and trying to get that name out there, as well as the Scots pine. And pine is best with that name. It declined around 15, 1500, sorry, it declined around 1500 BC. and was reintroduced in 17th century, from, mostly from Scotland, and thus the name Scots pine stuck. There wasn't many, um, I'm not great me, Irish before it, but there are there aren't many Irish names. There, are, there are, I don't know what the current one is, but there are some old names. But they again, God, or can be traced back to Scotland. So, which sort of indicate that they well and truly died out. It, you know, they weren't part of the culture of um, the Irish people at the time. Whereas, as we know, we've got loads of case names with Dar in them, Oak and Mayo, you, and so on. But Scott, um, Scots Pine as an Irish name doesn't seem to occur much in place names. But Unlike other parts of Ireland where the pine had died out, they discovered, and this wasn't over, what didn't happen just once, over several, maybe 50, 60 years of different researchers doing cores when there would be corn the lakes or pollen. It's just like uh, the way nowadays they go up to the ice caps and they do cores of the ice and they can determine to the chemical composition of the, what was in the atmosphere back thousands of years ago. You can do something similar with the pine, sorry, with pollen. 
you can do cores into modes uh, and ponds. And from that, then those are experts in study and pollen can determine what species of plants were around at that time. And in rock forests, there's a continuous layer of pollen. There's no stop. In other parts of the country where people might think there's Scots pine, um, there they found that there was gaps in it that, it that had died out and was probably reintroduced by man. Now, there may possibly be other populations of Scots pine in the country that haven't been identified yet. But at the moment, the only known one that's native that's been there continuously since 1500 BC is rock, the one in rock forest, which is probably a couple of, I don't know, it's not even hardly 100 trees that are up there. And um, one of the reasons then why rock forests, why are they up in rock forests and not anywhere else? Well, the particular landscape is car karst landscapes, very limited grazing. And it was originally part of the rock forest estate in the 12th century to the 18th century. So they obviously offered that offer protection from anybody who might be coming in to cut them down. And they weren't that easily accessible in the first place. <clears throat> so to bring them more to what I got, how I got involved then was when I discovered that they were up there <clears throat> about 2017, I went about getting the site registered with the Forest Service as a seed stand. And then likewise, at the same time, trying to get a permit from the National Parks and Wildlife so I could go up and collect the cones from the trees. And one of the drivers of that for me was that it could be planted if, the, if people wanted to into native woodland scheme. You have to use native trees in the native woodland scheme. They don't necessarily have to be Scots pine from rock forest. You can, there's Irish Scots pine from elsewhere. Again, as I said earlier on, the Scots pine was reintroduced in Scotland. So um, a lot of those trees are now being planted widely as native trees. Um, and just a shot, snapshot there at the bottom, just to show how extreme the climate is. Typically, you would look up books and say trees should grow in this sort of conditions, you know, dry soils, so on. But up in the Burren, it's a karst landscape with extremes. I mean, you had the droughts of 2018 and you just, there was no water. And you could go up at this time of the year and some of these trees are standing in two and three, well, two foot of water for months on end and they still survive, are growing quite, I wouldn't say growing quite well, but are healthy. And it's a, it's a very relative term there. There is some uh, research in, I think um, National Parks are hoping to go, um, sorry, OP Dub, National Parks and Wildlife are hoping to do cores of the trees that determine the age of them in the coming um, year or so, as we talk about that. I should also mention that there's Colin Keller of the National uh, Botanic Gardens is also doing genetics on them to determine their lineage to even further prove that they're uh, the original Scots pine. Um, so I do go up around in the winter time and kill after I get my permit uh, and then a seed collection permit also from the Forest Service so that I can get them registered as um, certified seed. Um, go up in the month of, well, generally November into January, into February, depending on what the weather's like and so on. But the crop can be very variable as a, generally most trees have what's called mast years and it's no different really with pine. So some years it could be nothing. It was two years I got no cones. So it's quite fortunate that it just coincided with this EIP money that came through that I actually have a good few plants, whereas next year I won't have any half the amount of plants um, as I try to build up stocks again. The other thing is then is when you do collect them, the cones, because they're um, the nature of them, they, they have adapted, not open readily. Um, I put them in a hot press, but it can take them to a year or two to open up fully. So I don't even get all the seeds out of them. Um, so there, the bottom page, the top picture then is the cones just up um, on, on the trees and the, some of the cones will look like they're viable, but you sort of get a tray and die and you realise they're not. So you could look at trees, oh, there's loads of cones in them, but uh, basically they have no viable seed in them. Um, then the bottom there picture, you have um, the cones as they are when they're picked and that's when they open up after a year to two years in heat. So just a couple of snaps of the, the situation that is with the, where to grow. you got the one up there, it's just barely hanging in. Um, a big threat up in the barn currently in rock forest is pre, um, animals eating them, uh, particularly uh, goats. 
And to this end, National Parks, my life there, you can't really see, it's not a clear picture, you see the bottom um, bottom left picture where my cursor is. This last year, they put little fencing, fencing um, uh, rabbit wire, chicken wire, around them to stop the goats going in. So hopefully that will have a positive impact. Um, this tree up here on the right just looks dead. You go up and you think it's about to fall over, but when you hit it, does not it's not budging. Yeah, and it, of course that sort of tree is very important as anybody would know about bats, roots, and so on, and beetles and so on, to uh, the ecosystem. But when you're standing there, you think it's about to fall over, but it's still, I say, it lasts another fifty years standing up there. Which would also indicate that they're so the grain on them or the annual growth rings on them are probably very, very narrow. They'd have to be very narrow. So the timber is very uh, dense compared to normal Scots pine that would be grown in good land where it'd be very wide growth rings. So I'll make slide. So I then get the seeds out and I start them off year one to grow in these trays. And um, very germination. And you don't really know. We just saw them and see what happens. Um, hope for the best. And then around midsummer, then plant them out into pots, into this size up year two. And finally, this is sort of when I'd be selling most of them would be in what's called two deer pots. And you can see the height of them in ideal conditions. That's how much they can grow. I don't do there. Next one. So the pine then growing the burn pine. Um, and other species, the other trees that you may also get, but I'll be obviously focusing mostly on the boron pine. Um, they'll grow about 35 meter tall and can live easily to 200 years. As I said, the oldest one there in the UK is 400 years old. So that's a good indication as how old the ones could be up in the burn. It'll be very interesting to find out that. They're known as in the timber trader, we're known as red deal. You don't hear that term used much. Very important species for red squirrels. And they are very light demanding, um, where something like beech can grow in the shade, so they need plenty of light, so you just wouldn't go plant them underneath other trees. The site, I would imagine most people, you know, already ready, pick their site out, and that's where they're going to push. So if the site is a site um, that is a bit in the wet side, it may need draining. Um, and I'll go, go, go a little bit down to another slide there, but basically, shallow drain, but you don't want to be cutting a drain into um, into an aquatic zone, into a river or a stream. You stop a short five metres uh, buffer strip just to stop silt going in. That's the main reason. That'll be normal forestry practices now. And if you have a wet area, then you plant the birch and alder down there. That's the site. So ground preparation. Now, there's no reason you don't necessarily need to do this. So just say, uh, just let people know that it can be done. If you've got a normal site, most sites you could probably just dig the holes and hit plants, dig the hole and put your trees in. Um, uh, you don't need to go doing this, but just to cover because I don't know. There's a range of sites. If you have there's basically in normal forestry practices two types of mount, mounting, mounting with drains, and then there's inverted mounting. There's no drains. So I just go mounting with drains. The advantage is you get this drain here, you can see it. And then this other picture goes down the field, usually 12 meter space in shallow drain and takes the water away. Um, so that's one of the things. Other advantage of mounting is you get this double layer, you turn the, the sod up on top of one another, you create a sort of sandwich effect. So you get a better, better soil um, for planting your tree into. So it gets a better start. You know, it's got a double layer of good quality soil. You've got pre-made locations of somebody, you got somebody in to do it and you're getting other people to help you. You don't have to worry about the spacing because it's all there. And it gives a good head start against um, vegetation, particularly in the first year. And after that, it doesn't give that much, not that much of a difference. Uh, so you don't have to be running out in the month of May to get the grass away. If you, if you, that's the thing about if you plant in the flat, you're going to have to be on top of them in terms of grass vegetation, which I'll come to the next slide. Then inverted mounting, which probably could be considered more environmentally sound um, because you don't create any drains. And it does again have the advantage over the just no preparation because there could possibly could be pan layer or hard layer there, and you did break that up and it helps the roots penetrate better into the ground. Planting location again is ready 
Um, so these are all small sites, so that isn't a, a big a deal for most of the people that we're planting. And gives a head start, but probably not uh, against vegetation, because obviously you've got this brown area where there's no there, there's no vegetation, there's no the roots being turned upside down, and you're, it's, there's not as much seeds in this um, upturn, upturned sod. So basically, in this situation, you just dig a hole and you turn, and you can see there the digger, and you just turn it back in with the uh, with the sod facing down, uh, and what was underneath the ground is facing up. So they, as I say. You don't need to do these in a lot of cases. I just given them there as options. Some people may want to do that, and they do they, obviously a bit of ground preparation does help the tree grow better than just plonking it in. But I can't say some sites won't need it. If it's a dry, good agriculture, they probably won't. But then, as I say, there's advantages because you have predetermined planting areas and that little bit of help against weeds um, that we grow on. So what you yeah, i'm dealing only with the pine as i say um what most people will be getting is this range of trees so on the left is uh, they're all scots pine they're all they're this these two here are the same age just slightly you know they can grow as well um these may be a bit younger uh but the main because this all came about fairly all of a sudden you know it was you couldn't plan ahead to know how many you would have and then i'm also working with seeds and supply this is why the pot sizes are going to be different but i just wanted to highlight obviously if if it's in a plastic pot you need to remove the plastic pot but if you get this plant it's in a it's a coconut core pot fiber you don't need to remove it just leave it on and just plant it all these others you'll have to remove the pot obviously these three at the end you don't you just put them in and these are small you don't need a big hole for them either um and this you're going to see white in them and that's actually good because that's mycorrhiza that's coexisting with the roots and helps the trees grow better um storage plant them as soon as possible and there's actually a practical reason that because i know myself you buy them or you get them and you say i'll plant them next week and next week comes and you don't plant them you're going to plant them the next week and suddenly a month goes by and you start planting them and they're dried out so as soon as you get to get them, as soon as you get to try and get them in as soon as possible, because they will start drying out, uh, particularly the bare root stuff. Um, store them in a cool, dark place in the meantime. And in relation to the pots, just leave them outside. Now, if you get these ones down here, these Scots fine, they will have to get, they will dry out very quickly. They will need to be kept in some sort of uh, bag. But if you plant within a week, at this time of year, there won't be an issue. So I would say to most people, just aim and trying to get them in within a week or so of getting them. Um, now, just some general thoughts on um, planting. Uh, again, I don't know who my audience is. Some people will know about this. You just dig a hole slightly. In the case of the, the bigger pot there, you dig a hole slightly bigger. Just dig it, dig it, and dig it bigger, and then just chop up the bottom of the soil. Um, you could put if you dig a really big hole, you could put the sod that you dig off here and just turn it up because it'll be good for the tree. Um, you don't necessarily need to do that, but just to, don't just squeeze it into any size hole and then just put the soil around the tree, shove it back in, just shake the tree gently from the top just to make sure it goes in and then just firm it in. Um, now, I'm just looking up here, I sort of was looking at the pictures there first. I said remove the pot. If it's a bare root tree, the root collar, and this is slightly swollen area. You don't plant, if you planted it up around here, you, potentially some trees will die if you're planted too deep. So you see this natural sort of swelling area around here. You see it on the tree, just above where the roots are. That's the depth you want to plant to. Um, don't go, as I said, burying it. Probably be will die. And firm the tree, firm the, uh, the ground around the tree. You don't want to ram it in, just give it, it shouldn't be able to be able to have a hold of it at the tip and it shouldn't pull out, you know, you don't have to tug it, but a good firm pull it should stay in. The spacing then, it suggests the space for Scots pine. Normal forestry practice would be two by two, but that's a different setup. Um, but we're, so we were suggesting three by three meters. And then for the other minor species, 1.5 by 1.5. Um, Again, as I said, normal forestry practices will be two by two, and the two is much to do with machinery going down the rows as anything else um, to it machinery. So after maybe, particularly 
this time of year, if you get wet, windy weather, the, the trees might, they might rock a little bit in the ground. So you might need to go around and refirm them. Um, and you don't really need to cane them, uh, particularly these pines anyway, there should be no need to cane them, but just to keep an eye that they don't rock in the ground because if they rock then the, the roots won't be firm and they just won't get the root in properly. Every time they send out root hairs, it just break away, particularly in the drier weather. Plant your trees straight. And as I said, they're under one meter, so they don't need support. And I'd imagine that, um, I haven't seen them now, that the bare root trees are also the same that they wouldn't be that big. So trees don't really need caning. Now, uh, another thing is, depending on your site and your location, you may need to do fencing. Uh, and there's, the, the obvious ones are livestock, sheep, and cattle. Uh, ghosts being another one, depending on where you are. I just, I, sorry, I skipped the first one there, tubes. Tubes are, are widely used and are very good, but don't put them around Scott's Pine because it just forced them up and then you get a top heavy tree and then have bad root structure and just fall over. So you, if you want to put something around Scott's Pine individually, it has to be some sort of wire mesh. Um, hairs, hairs could be a problem, particularly in the early time of the year, not so much in the summer. Uh, so you need, just need to keep an eye on that. You may not need it. You may not have airs around, um, but if you do, you might have to put some like traditionally we would put in forest situation, put um, fence to plot off with ch chicken wire. Uh, um, it's, you, know, just, you don't need to bury it in the case of hairs. It just needs to be touching the ground and it has to be high enough so that it can't jump in over it. Deer is another issue, as I say, but maybe tubes. Um, for the, the broad leaves and then a mesh, if, if you're doing it individually, because uh, to put deer fence around a plot this side would probably be prohibitive. You're talking about over 20 euros a meter, so I don't think anyone's going to do that. Um, rabbits, well, hopefully you don't have rabbits because they're just notorious for getting in. You might be better off moving your plot uh, than, than uh, trying to fence them out, but it can be kept out. You have to bury the wire in this case, facing out where the rabbits are. A new threat is, uh, I didn't actually put a picture up here, but he's like a mouse to the normal eye. Uh, they're called bank balls. They're making a comeback now. And it's not so much when you plant them that they'll be the problem. It's probably more likely in, I was sadly, in three, four years' time. You could be saying, oh, my trees are all doing great. And then you just go out one day, you have them there for six months, and you suddenly they're all turning yellow, and you can't figure out why. To the right is what to do. They will start chewing the, um, the bark of the tree and can climb up. Now, I don't know exactly whether to do a preference for Scots pine, but I grow trees and shrubs myself in a nursery and they're here. And every year they, have a, they go for something different. And hardly one year and God knows why else. Spindle another year. They um, haven't gone near the pine yet, but the cut. So it just is something to be aware of that when your tree is up and going, that there still could be this issue. And that's a, a very low chance now, though, so I wouldn't get overly concerned. It was just more that they are making a comeback. The population of bank falls is very high in Ireland. The, the West is mostly a West area, along the Shannon. Problem, it was a problem back in the 80s and 90s, but they died off, but they haven't made a comeback again. Now, the maintenance then, uh, so the first summer you need to grass clean. Uh, generally grass is going to be your problem uh, for most people that are planting and it can happen so quick as we all know you've got no grass one week and then two weeks later like it's a foot tall and in another week it's, eight, it's ten or two foot tall particularly with small trees and get smothered very quickly and then you can't find them and you, you lose them and then when you do expose them to the sun they sort of get burnt like they're very soft and they just if there's a hot week they just mess so you don't need to do anything major just to pull the grass away from them and um, trample it down and that in itself acts sort of as a mulch because the grass trampled down now and it stops other vegetation coming up don't go in with strimmers a nightmare because no matter how good you are you're going to hit you're going to hit them and it, as i say it actually stimulates growth as I say, in the next one the vegetation just comes up even better so just trample go in with you uh, you don't even need a slash hook in a lot of cases just Go in with your boot and just pull the grass away in about 30 to 50 centimeters diameter around the tree just enough so that that tree can get the light um again you have to do this again in the autumn 
and that'd be this autumn and uh, next year then you would have to do the same thing come summer the same process by 2024 you may not need to do with some of them some of the smaller st trees you might have but it should be more or less up and going at that stage uh, so I already mentioned threats. Well, there are a lot of threats, and these are again. I just highlight these as things for the future, not to be thinking too much about some. Obviously, obviously, they, we refer to the animals, which are uh, can happen straight away. But uh, I suppose diseases. There's red band needle blight. It's been found in Ireland, and then there's nematodes. Guy, you could you just go go on, and there's no point getting worked up. But if you did. Sometimes the trees will die off and they will recover. So you don't need to panic too much if you, if you see the pine sort of dying off. But you just need to be aware that there are diseases there that can potentially kill them. I'm trying to think now. I think that's it. So it's a bit quicker maybe than I thought it would be. But I presume there's questions. And that's, that's probably... That's fabulous, available. Bernard. Thank you very much for that. I thought that was brilliant. Really good. Bang lot. on time, half an hour. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, perfect. I have one question for you, Bernard, in the in the QA session. I'm sure there's going to be popping up more. Um, the first one is does the addition of chicken manure pellets benefit when planting? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say don't put them in. Um yeah, there's no harm. Uh, sometimes some trees don't need them, but if you have them, just don't put too much in, small handful. Yeah, if you want to, uh, but uh, if you've got good soil, a lot of soil in Ireland is quite fertile. It's, I think the biggest problem with a lot of the soil planting sites, would, I'm not saying this particular project, but what I would see is actually water logging as opposed to fertility. But to be no harm in putting them in. Okay. Um, um, if anyone feels like uh, sending on any questions, we still have some time. Um, please let us know. If you want to chat to Bernard, since we have time, let us know and we can uh, um, let you enable your audio to work so you can ask the question yourself. Yeah, I have I have one here yeah. from Palem. He says, great talk, Bernard, very interesting. What was it that killed off the pine in Ireland up to the 17th century? So that's a bit of background information. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the climate change is supposed to be one of the main reasons and then probably uh, farming coming in the, the the onset of farming, cutting down the trees, but a combination of both. I suppose that you, you could prove it that is anybody who's ever been around bogs, you had the amount of pine stumps that you'll find, you know, buried in bogs. So obviously they were there at one point and then they just covered over. So climate change being the main factor for the decline of Scott's pine just got too wet. Okay. Thanks for that, Bernard. Uh, there's another question from Tony. How do you decide on the land being too wet? Well, I suppose around this part of the world, uh, when we say too wet, that might need to do drainage. Uh, rushes now uh, go out now and if you're the water up around your covering the top of your foot, sort of it, it's probably very wet and it will need some form of drainage. I think that's a good um, indication. If you've got a lot of rushy ground and you walk through it at the moment and there's water just going above your foot, it's probably too wet and it will need some form of drainage. Yeah. That makes sense. Thanks. Uh, we have Sarah who wants to know, um, should they plant all the pines together or mix them with the rest of the trees? The right. I would plant the pine together and then the miner, you could probably put some oak maybe in there. I, it depends on the size of the plot. If you have 200 trees, I'd probably put in a few oak. Um, maybe you could put 10 in groups, 10 in a group, maybe two, three groups. But then all the other trees would be more or less inclined to put them around the side. Particularly the um, the holly. What was the other ones we were putting in? Um, hawthorn. To... Yeah, hawthorn obviously around the edge. Hazel around the, the edge. And the alder and the birch around the edge. But the, I, I, if, if somebody was doing a plot of 200, I would probably put in some birch in there too, you know, um, yeah. five or so, in, in just to break them up, yeah. But generally, the, the core group would be the Scots pine. Uh, but I wouldn't go putting hazel or holly or hawthorn in the middle of them um, because you're just going to get to disappear after a couple of years. From, yes. Uh, yeah. Grow to the Scots pine. Is it because now just to uh, explain that, just because oak and pines would grow to be the biggest and the, you, the others are sort of understory species, so yeah. they, they'll do well, better in the natural, under, 
in the natural situation, uh, birch is the one um, it will come in first in any landscape, and then the Scots follows afterwards, and then you will sort of get the oaks coming in. Um, but the, yeah, I would, in a forest, in a normal forest situation, Ireland, we would plant Scots pine and oak in rows, and the both grow together. So there's no reason why you can't put them in amongst them, the oak. But I, I think to give it a more natural look, to put in groups, 10, yeah. 12 oak among your Scots pine. So it depends on money again, because it got some people are only some are getting 200 and something, and others are only getting 50. But you could put in this the oak. And you could put a few birds, but I'd keep the alder and that then maybe just to the edges. Yeah. Yep. All right. So there's a question from Joe. He says we're having major problems with ash dieback from a neighborhood scheme 15. Uh, 15 years ago in a community park and do you think we can replace these trees yeah you can there's uh, there is a scheme at the moment if they were planted under the forest service scheme there's a there's a scheme you can apply to and get grant aided and you can plant yeah you can, you, if it's already because well, obviously it's already broadleaf you have to replant broadleaves and then there's a limited number there's oak sycamore birch alder and then the minor species um I and I'm sure, depending on, I don't know the situation, but the possibility of putting in a few pine too, a small number of pine into the, but you wouldn't, you couldn't go back in, well, they don't want you to go back in with spruce into those situations, conifers no. in general, they yeah. want to keep it broadly because that's what they were originally. Yeah, I hope that makes sense, Joe. Um, Phelan is asking what mycelium mix do you use? No, they come, they come with the plants. The trees are providing them themselves. I, I, don't, I, leave, them, I leave them to if they know best. <laughs> okay and then chris uh, asks can you move a pine once it's established if it's too close to other pines yeah that's a good question because um some people might decide after a few years maybe they want to tin them out a bit and what better way than to transplant them up to about six seven years you can transplant them without any problem you just need to make sure you take a good big root ball this now would be totally out of normal foresting because normal forest you're not supposed to go near trees, but this is different and this is a good way of maybe getting them around your farm. Take a good root ball, so something like uh, twice the size of a bucket, let's say, you know, a standard uh, bucket of a root ball, and they need to be well staked uh, when they're transplanted. But up to about seven, eight years, and that might be a way, somebody might, as he pointed out, it might be a good idea to tin them that way rather than cutting them, but uh, actually bring them to another part of your farm because as I said there are unique trees that are the best of everybody are the sciences that there are the original so they're not just a standard bog um, um scots pine that you can buy in anywhere that could be coming in from europe if, if they're not registered as native uh, you know because there's pine coming in from holland and wherever at the moment along with the native trees we have but these are the original so that could be a nice thing to do turn have a second here as corner in three or four years time uh, you know five years best six years time in another part of the farm yeah for yeah. sure <laughs> is there any other management um bernard in addition to trampling the grass back i know twice a year um is there anything yeah. to look out for uh, in terms of signs of damage or yeah well i, I did cover it there damage well, you may have to replace, but you put there's a nice number of trees being put in for most people. So they, unless they all were to die, there was a group to die, you wouldn't need to replace them. You just live with a few that die here and there. They're inevitably, typically with 10, 20% might fail, but you might get known because some of these are in pots, so they have a better survival rate. It all depends on the weather. But you could look at a bit of fertilization, you know, um, if people wanted to do that. Um, it's hard enough to get. We'd use ground rock phosphate. But my experience now is we're probably over enthusiastic years ago fertilizer. A lot of these trees that do fine. And the fact that those, I'll, particularly it's got fine, as I say, they have their own mycorrhiza with them. They, I didn't put that on them. They, that white, it, 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 I haven't seen it with any other tree it grow, but, um, or it's rare to see it. But nearly all the plants seem to have this, whether it's coming off the seed or whatever. So you, that's going to help to take off nutrients and soil. So it would be limited. Um, fertilization or any other thing just mainly keep the grass and keep the animals that might eat them keep an eye out because and as i said the hares could be the first ones to come in and um, from now on they're going to be active seems to be my experience february march and april is when the hares do most damage to young trees 
And when they're up to two or three years, the hairs don't bother, but then you might have deer. So you just have to keep an eye. Every, I understand there's over 40 people that are taking trees, so that every situation is going to be different. Yep, brilliant. I have, I, have more qu I have a question from Paul. He's asking if planting where an old grove of spruce and pine were, uh, should the stumps all be dug up or removed? No, I don't. Just plant between the stumps. If they, uh, yeah, he said the stumps, so there's no trees. Um, no, I wouldn't go ripping up stumps, causing more damage to the soil. Just plant in between them and find a good spot. And they should do fine. Just let the other stumps run away. The only thing I would uh, concern, I don't know how old that site is, uh, when it, um, I didn't cover it. You know, if, if, if it was only a year to cut down, they could have weevil come in um, and it could eat all the bark in a similar fashion to the, the bank ball and kill them. But if it's, if it's a draw of stumps there, five, six years, probably won't be a problem. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, I have no more questions here in the Q&A box. Is there anything else, Pranji? Is there anything else you want to um, I can't think of it. I think that was really good, Bernard, really yeah. um, comprehensive. And um, I hope answered all the main questions. And maybe if people have any more that they think of, they could uh, email you, Karen, yeah. And, yeah. and we can try I'll make sure and, that uh, Bernard gets them. build them up for, uh, for Bernard next time. And Yeah, we'll be, they'll be Saturday anyway, so... Yeah, and you'll see Bernard absolutely. when you're collecting your trees on yeah, Saturday, so... It might, so, be, um, it might be more easier to interact with people than through a screen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If anyone has any questions, I hope uh, you, you have the capacity to carry them on, on Saturday. Um, I think, Karen, you may have highlighted that in the emails before. So, um, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Okay. Anyone, anyone over 30 pine trees, please make sure you bring either two cars or a van or a trailer, but it should all be fine um, and they're, they're, they should all fit. So uh, yeah, just just a final reminder. We'll see you on the twelfth. If anything changes, let us know. Uh, I saw in the chat that some people had some problems with hearing me at the beginning. Hopefully that was solved, but it will certainly be solved um, in the recording. So you can always watch this again if you need to. Uh, there's one thing Joe Gary has said. If, appreciate if you have any link or knowledge of the grand scheme you mentioned to replace the ash suffering, and he's given yeah. his email. Oh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I've I've copied that, so I'll make sure you get that question, Bernard. Yeah, Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's great. Cool. Thanks, yeah. Emil Bernard. That's great. Thanks a million. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Okay. Bye. All right. Enjoy okay. the evening. Thank Bye. you.